Hello and welcome to today's video. So today we're going to be looking at the Zone Director and some best practices of how I would typically use it depending on certain scenarios. So without further ado, let's begin. So first of all, I'm going to go to Access Points and I'm going to configure our system default. So just to note, at the time of this video, we're actually on version 10.4, but any platform on the Zone Director that is on version 10 and above will have very similar settings. So first of all, I'm just going to go on to our AP group and edit this. So you'll notice by default, um, it's actually pre-selected the channels for me. If it hasn't, what I would normally suggest people do is only enable channels 1, 6 and 11 on the 2.4 gigahertz band. This is the non-overlapping channels and it just means that we can ensure that our APs aren't going to interfere with one another on those channels. What I then also do is it will sometimes hard code the channels for you. Uh, or the channelization rather. So I'll actually set the 2.4 gigahertz to be 20 megahertz wide. And now for five gigahertz, sometimes it might be on auto. If it is, I'd highly advise you either use 40 or 20. So when you're using a 40 megahertz channel, you're actually bonding two channels together. So typically what I would say is, um, if you're going for say a hospitality area or a skyscraper deployment, you would probably want to use 20 megahertz channels because you've got that many APs around as well as if they're in a corridor placement, you'd probably want to use 20 megahertz channels simply so that you've got more non-overlapping channels to use in the five gigahertz spectrum. Otherwise, if you start bonding channels together, you limit the amount of channel reuse you have available. So I typically go with 20 megahertz. Um, if it's say a school or a big wide open area, then I'll probably use 40 megahertz channels. It really depends on the environment, but typically for a hospitality, for example, I'd go with 20 megahertz. What we can then do is modify our transmit power. So this is very specific and this requires you to know your site automatically. So by default, auto mode is perfectly fine. It's actually going to automatically adjust the transmit power based on the amount of interference the APC from one another. So that means that it's going to adjust the cell range and uh, based on the interference values. Now, if you wanted to, you can actually hard code this and say full power. So all the APs will automatically be running at 20 dB, but you may not want to do that. Um, simply because it can cause too much interference. Again, it depends on whether you're in, in a corridor, for example, or if you're going in room, especially in hospitality. Most of the time, for most deployments, I'll actually leave it on auto and let the AP decide the transmit power, and that's worked very well for me. Um, if I do have APs in a corridor, however, um, and I'm finding that they're not bleeding into the rooms accordingly because of the design that I've chosen, then you may need to hard code the power um, and set one of the various dB values. So minus dB is basically minus one dB away from 20 dB. So be careful with it. Personally, I'd leave it at auto. Um, climate mission control, I tend to leave this alone because uh, the Ruckus APs perform a lot better without us trying to decide what airtime usage we should have a limit on. Um, and then the seed protection mode. So I'll tend to use CTS only instead of request to send and clear to send and just let the AP tell the client when it's clear to send and when they can transmit. Moving down then, um, so you have the other options available for your model specific settings. So uh, this isn't a best practice to say, this is just something that I do. So if you've got an access point in say a bedroom or a sensitive area where you don't want people to see the LED status because it'd be quite um, infuriating to see the bright lights, then what I would do is I would disable the LEDs depending on the radio. So for example, I've got an R710 at my house. I might click on the R710 and I'm going to disable the LED status as well. Um, but I also might then enable the 5.8 gigahertz channels. So the 5.8 gigahertz channels are basically more channels to play with. So you've got different uni, uni bands. So you've got uni one, uni two, uni two extended. You're basically just allowing the AP to use those additional channels on the five gigahertz frequency. So you have more channel reuse available. Um, you can also then change the POE operating mode. But typically, if you're in hospitality, for, as an example, um, you may be looking at the H510. So on the H510, you'd probably want to disable the LEDs potentially, um, but you also may want to disable the Ethernet ports as well. So disable any Ethernet ports you're not using if the AP is in plain sight. Or if it is in plain sight, you may want to change what the VLAN tag is going to be to make sure that a client can't connect into the AP management VLAN. And that's it for the group settings. So I'm just going to click OK to that. So next we're going to create a WLAN. So the WLAN is fairly generic and the same settings can be applied to any real sector. So whether you're a school, whether you're in a hospitality area. 
So I'm just going to create a generic WLAM. So I'm going to call it test. Um, then we leave it standard access. Now you may be using a captive portal, so you can probably gloss over the authentication and encryption mechanisms here. I was going to leave it as none for the moment. Um, but then under advanced options, so if I'm in a hospitality area, I may want to actually stop client wireless clients from communicating to one another. Um, I may, may wish to do so so that they can't file transfer peer-to-peer -peer, or you know snoop on each other's traffic. So I can isolate the traffic from one another straight away. Um, I may want to impose a lay through access control list, so block every client from talking to the private network um, and only allow them to talk to the internet. So you can see by default it allows DNS and DHCP, but I may block the 192, the 10, the 172, um, and then set the allow all by default so that if no policy is matched, it will allow them on to the internet and away they go. Um, I will probably want to enable application recognition and control. Um, this is handy to have enabled just so you can see what applications people are using. You know, it's always good to know to see how your network is actually being utilized. So it'll identify whether they're using Facebook, YouTube, and how much data they're actually transmitting. Then you may want to impose a rate limit. So you may want to impose a rate limit across the whole SSID. Um, I personally don't do this, but it may be something you want to do. So you can either do it across the whole SSID as a whole, or you can do it in your layer three, four segment up here and block it on a per client basis. Then what we may want to do is, well, we actually want it to load balance the APs. So we want to load balance uh, the access points or rather load balance the clients between access points. We probably also want to ban balance. So we probably want to balance the number of devices between 2.4 and 5 gigahertz so that we can get a fair share and also, you know, make sure they're using the frequencies correctly and not saturating one frequency over the other. What we then may want to do, so um, the DTIM level is actually how often a device has to wake up for beacon frames. So one is for the best performance. If, however, say you're in a warehouse environment um, or even you have uh, SSID that's specifically for mobile devices or VoIP phones in hospitality, you may actually want to increase the DTIM to, say, two or three. Um, and you do this solely so the device can sleep for longer, meaning that the battery life is conserved. Because if you have it as the highest performance set to one, then the device has to wake up constantly to basically download all the data. So it's good for performance, bad for battery life. Now, personally, for the multicaster broadcast threshold, I'll actually set this to zero so that devices, um, or rather so that multicast and broadcast do not get converted to unicast traffic, because that can cause some issues with the likes of Sonos, for example. So for that reason low, I just set it to zero. That means that it will always be transmitting broadcast as broadcast and multicast as multicast, and it will never convert it to unicast. I do tend to ignore client statistics. So if they're unauthorized, I don't really care about the, st the statistics of them. So I just tend to ignore it. I leave client fingerprinting enabled. So this is so I can detect the operating system that they're using and you know work out which operating system is being used the most. What I will then do is also enable OFDM only. So OFDM only, you've got to be slightly careful because it will stop legacy data rates from working, such as devices that use 802.11b, but it gives you a more advanced modulation codec. So what I will do is set the BSS minimum rate at 12 megabits per second, generally speaking. Now, this does depend on your environment as to what suits best, but generally I will personally use 12 and then see if I need to fine tune it afterwards. So what this actually does is it's telling the APs to listen to client devices who can communicate at a minimum of 12 megabits per second to them. If they can't, the device will not be allowed to connect and it will be forced to roam or connect to a nearer, nearer AP. So the reason why I tend to use this is iPhones, Android, you know, they tend to latch onto the first access point that they see and they never move away. So what I can do by using the BSS minimum rate is actually say, well, if you can't talk to me at 12 megabits per second, well, then you can't talk to me. So I'm going to force you to disconnect and connect to another AP that's nearer. And that's how you get the performance on those types of devices where they're sticky and don't tend to roam away. Now, there have been situations where I've actually set it to 24 megabits per second because um, I had lots of APs close together and I wanted the device to roam away really quickly. So I actually set it to 24 megabits per second. Now, if I was to leave it a default, that's actually using 6 megabits per second. Now, I may use this if I'm just if I found out that, for example, there's an AP that's too far away um, from my cell coverage and my cell coverage isn't quite as good as it could be, 
So I may be allow it to use six megabits per second so it's not stuck in a black spot and it can still connect to that AP that's just within reach. Um, you've then got your idle inactivity timeout. So this is dependent on environment as well. Um, five minutes is fine. For some devices, it can be too aggressive whereby it's idle, it doesn't reconnect. So, you know, sometimes people may say, well, actually, I'll give you 60 minutes and then I'll disconnect you. I don't tend to enable 82.11k neighbor reporting, specifically if I'm in an area where I don't know what client devices are going to be connecting. So if I'm in a school, I will know what devices are connecting. It's probably going to be Windows or iPads. I'll enable 11k so that my devices or rather my access points can communicate with one another and let them know about what devices are on the network and if they could potentially roam away to that AP. The reason why I don't enable this for the likes of, say, a hospitality guest network is for the sole reason that MacBooks don't actually support 82.11k. And because they don't support it, what can happen is the device can be kicked off the network and it's actually the device that disconnects because it doesn't understand the protocol. So I've had some really odd results with Apple MacBooks. So for that reason alone, on a guest network, I'll actually not enable 11k. Um, but if I know what devices are connecting at all times, then I will because it's beneficial to do so. And that's kind of it for the best practices. So thank you for watching today's video.